Hi, I'm Chris Mushler, VCDX257 from virtualelephant.com. And in this video, I'm going to show you the easy steps to configuring the NSX Advanced Load Balancer within your VMware SDDC environment so that it can be leveraged by both NSX and Tanzu. Let's get started. The version of the NSX Advanced Load Balancer that we'll be installing today is 22.1.4, and it's the most current version. It's currently compatible with vSphere 8, as well as TKG 2.x, and NSX 4.1, which I have running within my environment. Let's just jump right into the GUI for vCenter, and I'll show you how I deployed the OVA and started the configuration of the NSX Advanced Load Balancer. So the first thing that you want to do is log into vCenter like I've done here, and then we're just going to go through the normal deploy OVF template. So once you select the file that you downloaded for the NSX Advanced Load Balancer, go ahead and just configure the rest of the information as you would typically do when you deploy an OVA. We're going to go ahead and fast forward through this part as it goes through and deploys it into my lab environment. Now this video is going to show you first how to just do this with one controller, but then at the very end, I've got a bonus for how to actually go ahead and configure the ALB cluster as well. Now that the advanced load balancer controller has been deployed and powered on, we're going to go ahead and log into the GUI. Now the first time that you go to the GUI, it's actually going to prompt you to set the password and to specify an email address. Once you've done that, it's going to immediately put you into this screen where you need to select a passphrase, tell it the DNS resolvers, the DNS search domain, as well as specify some information around tenancy and SMTP. For the SMTP, you can change the email address that all of the emails will be coming from when alerts are sent from the controller, but for the multi-tenancy, for the most part, you can leave that as the default setting. Now, once that's done, you'll click Save, and then at that point, we'll be ready to actually start configuring the environment. Once you're logged into the UI, go to the infrastructure and then clouds button, and then you'll see the default cloud. From here, we want to edit and actually select the new type instead of it being set to no orchestrator like it is by default. We're going to go ahead and select VMware vCenter slash vSphere ESXi, and then we're going to put our credentials in for the vCenter server. Once that's done, we'll save it, and then we'll go through and continue to edit it specifically for our environment. You can also see here that one of the improvements in the 22 branch of the ALB is the ability for it to leverage the content library and actually be able to do that within your environment. So if you have a content library like I do in my lab, you can select that here as well as going out and filling information for the DNS resolvers and then the IPAM and I, uh, DNS profiles. And you're going to want to make sure that you set up a default IPAM and a default DNS profile. Now, once it's saved, you're going to go through and select the management network. When you're configuring the management network, you also want to make sure that you select the IP network, the default gateway, and then give it an address pool that it can consume IP addresses for for the service engines. When you are creating the IPAM profile for your environment, after giving it a name, you want to make sure that you select the usable networks within this field. Now, these usable networks as part of the default cloud are going to be the networks that you're going to be provisioning the service engines to. So here you can see that first I select DPG management, followed by a number of Kubernetes segments that I've created for my environment within my NSX controller. Once those are done, you can go ahead and click save. Once the IPAM profile is created, I go ahead and I create a DNS profile as well. Now this is pretty basic, just give it a name and then the domain name that you'll be using and that's all the information that you need for this part. At this point, you want to just review all of the things that you've entered here on the screen and then go ahead and click save. Now this will finish configuring the default cloud for us, at which point we're ready to let it have a moment or two to communicate with the vCenter server before it fully ingests all of the inventory items and we go on to the next step. From here, we're gonna to go to cloud resources and then we're gonna select the service engine group and we're gonna look at the default group. We're gonna go ahead and change a couple of these settings. Now these will vary based off of what your 
business requirements and technical requirements are. But I do like to enable the real-time metrics. Now, one of the settings that I do change is the number of virtual services per service engine. And I increase this up to 25. Now, this number can go from anywhere from 1 to 200. Now, I'm going to leave this as compact after reading it. Um, just to give you an idea of what's there and then the scale per virtual service going to let that go ahead and be the default. Now one of the things that I do change is the service engine folder and I have one called SDN. I leave the prefix but you can go ahead and change that based off of your needs and then I increase the vCPUs per service engine to two and I increase the memory to four. Now this should be a, a two times ratio so for every vCPU you have, you should go ahead and double the amount of memory. Now from here you go through and you select the cluster and the hosts that you want to allow the service engines to be deployed to. And then you go ahead and select the data stores as well. And I'm explicit in that I specify an include rule and specify the two LUNs and the three hosts that I have. And that's pretty much it. Go ahead and click save and we're all set from a service engine deployment perspective. Now you can see here we don't yet have any service engines. We do have our networks, however. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go through and configure several pools for our networks. Now these pools will be used for both VIPs and for the NICs that the service engines consume within our environment. So you can see that the management pool is already there. We did that when we set up the cloud. If you have more networks, you can go ahead and expand the list like I did here. And then from here, I'm going to go ahead and configure the cluster mesh VIP as well as the Tanju VIP to have a pool associated with both networks. Once you've gone ahead and done that, then you're all set and we're ready to actually deploy a dummy virtual service so that we can see that the actual service engines get deployed correctly. Now we can go to the applications and we can see that we have nothing configured yet. So first we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna create a VIP that we're gonna consume for our dummy virtual service. Now the point of creating the virtual service is to actually make sure that we have everything configured correctly within the environment. If something is not working appropriately, the service engines won't deploy and configure themselves. And so this is a good check before you go ahead and start leveraging the NSX Advanced Load Balancer. So again, you're just gonna go through here and you're gonna select the, the VIP cluster placement network that you want, the segment that you're gonna put it on and click save. Now that you have that selected, go ahead and click save and it will actually go through and auto provision an IP address. We can see here that it grabbed 10.237.0.50, and that's one of the cluster mesh VIPs that I had in that network. Now from here, we can go back and we can select virtual services now, and we can go ahead and create our virtual service. So we're just gonna head and give it a name, and then you can select the application type. Again, this is for a dummy virtual service, so I just leave it as HTTP. You select the VIP that you just created. We don't have any actual uh, pools or VMs that we're going to do. So we'll go ahead and click save. And now at this point in the background, it's going to start deploying the service engines within vSphere. And so we'll be able to see that here in just a moment when we switch to the vCenter GUI. So here's the vCenter GUI. You can actually see that it's uploading some files first to the content library. And so it's actually uploading the OVA for the service engines for 22.1.4. Now, once it's gone ahead and uploaded it, it goes through and actually starts deploying two service engines and configures them on the back end. Now, this will vary the amount of time that it takes based off of your lab environment. In mine, it took about six minutes, but we'll go ahead and fast forward this until the end. So once it's deployed the OVAs, we can switch back to the NSX Advanced Load Balancer UI we can go to the cloud resources and the service engine option under infrastructure, and we can see that they still show the VMs in an initializing state. It's going through and it's actually configuring a couple additional VNICs based off of the VIP network that it's deploying on, as well as making sure that everything within the service engine is configured correctly. Now this part will take a couple minutes, but once it's done, it will eventually change to being status of green. Once it gets to the green status and it shows as up, we know at that point that we're ready to go ahead and start leveraging our NSX Advanced Load Balancer further within our environments, such as deploying a Tanzu Kubernetes grid cluster. Now that the service engines are green, we're ready to start consuming this with a platform like Tanzu Kubernetes Grid. So you can go ahead and check out my other videos, which I have inside of my channel, 
which will show you how to actually deploy Tanzu Kubernetes Grid le leveraging the NSX Advanced Load Balancer. Now, if you've liked this content, you want to learn more about the VMware SDDC, VMware Cloud Foundation, Tanzu, and all things Kubernetes, check out my channel, Virtual Elephant, on YouTube. And if you enjoy this content, please make sure that you subscribe, smash the like button, and leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Until next time, thanks. As promised, bonus content on how to configure the controller in a cluster. So you're going to want to go ahead and deploy two additional OVAs for the extra ALB controllers, which I've already done here. And then you're going to go back through, log into each of them after they've been powered on. Go through that first initial setup where you specify a passphrase, configure the SMTP, as well as the multi-tenancy. Once you've configured the two additional ALB appliance controllers, go back to the first controller that you deployed, go to administration, and then under the controller menu on the left-hand side, select nodes, and then go ahead and hit edit. After you hit edit, it's going to give you an opportunity to add the additional nodes as well as change the host name of the first node. You can leave the name as a default, which is cluster-0-1, or you can give it a new name as well as you can specify the cluster IP that you're going to be using to load balance across the three controllers. From there, go ahead and click the add to add the additional two controllers, fill out the node IP, the host name and the password, as well as the public IP address if it's different from the internal IP. Once you've done that, you're gonna go ahead and hit save. And then this is going to take several minutes until you eventually see the screen change to this uh, configuring the cluster. Uh, page that you see here on the screen. Once it's at that point, it will eventually finish and then it'll allow you to open up a new browser window to the VIP that you specified as the cluster IP and off you go and you're all set. It's rather simplistic. Again, for lab environments, a single controller is probably more than adequate, but for anything that you're going to consider production grade, you're going to want to make sure that you deploy a three node NSX advanced load balancer controller cluster.